Hi, my name is Rob. Thank you for joining me on A Constantly Racing Mind. Today is a little bit different. I don't really have a fan pop, uh, co a custom build or anything like that. What I do have is something a little bit different. As I was doing my research on the Holy Grail, uh, an episode I did a little while ago, it came to mind that anytime you, you talk about the Holy Grail, you have to talk about King Arthur. Now, King Arthur, you know, we don't know if he really lived or not. We all like to think that there was somebody that um, legend was based on, you know, one particular king or maybe a couple kings uh, or warlords, a chieftain of ancient Britain, you know, that. Um, you know, eventually was formulated into the King Arthur legend. We know that in the 1100s, Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, actually was able to, you know, write him into history, essentially. Even though we do know that the name Arturus or something uh, similar to that was actually being used around AD 600. So doing my research on that, I actually came to the part where where he is supposedly buried in or on the Isle of Avalon. Now, a lot of people in England believe that the Isle of Avalon is Glastonbury. Now, if you take a look at Glastonbury, it doesn't look like it's actually an island at all, but at one time it was. So, on the Isle of Glastonbury, there is a, a, a monastery there, and I think it was like in the 1100s where uh, the monks that lived there were doing some digging, some excavations, and it came upon a log and inside the log were the bones of a, of a man and a woman and inside the inside the log there was actually a iron cross now that's the cross of Glastonbury or the Camden cross that uh, a later writer you know was able to kind of identify kind of draw out what it looked like and what it what it sh what it said of course it's all in Latin and what I did was I actually got a replica of that I'll leave, a, I'll leave the link in the description and so let's go ahead and take a look I mean it's not really a film prop per se but then again you could always tie it back to any King Arthur film or you know just a legend in general so let's go ahead and take a look archaeology is a search for fact not truth so when looking at the historical King Arthur we unfortunately must put aside all the romantic characters and imagery that we have been exposed to throughout our lives we must forget the tales of knights in shining armor and start from scratch with the story of King Arthur. I'm not even sure if there was a King Arthur. However, many Arthurian scholars do believe that there was someone who, historically, could fit the description. A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. We must first place Arthur in his time, born in the late 5th or early 6th century CE, and take the most special care that you locate Arthur in his place. The Isle of Britannia is forever his place. Knowing this, we must forget the following details. That Camelot was not a majestic stone castle, but perhaps a defensive wooden fortress on a hill. Merlin. The story of this character comes much later. There is a Welsh bard named Mithrin. If you knew French, you may be shocked by this name. Perhaps it was Latinized to Merlinus. The round table is not even mentioned until the second millennium CE. Sir Lancelot? Nope. 12th century French addition to the story. Guinevere? Again, a 12th century addition. However, we still use this name to some degree in the modern form. Jennifer. The Holy Grail. Definitely a French addition, which was not formally a sacred or even holy item. The Chivalric Code is once again a later addition to set an example for a time that needed it. Mordred, a later addition who could be either a villain or hero depending on a certain point of view. And the island of Avalon not mentioned until the 12th century, but this is where we have some possibilities. The late 5th century was a tumultuous time in the Roman Empire. In 410 the Goths sacked Rome and the legions were recalled home to defend the Eternal City. Thus gives rise to oral tales of a hero that turned back the Irish tide from the west and the Angles and Saxons from the east, at least for another 300 years. Romano Britons defending themselves against the invaders. These are the times of tales of Ambrosius Aurelianus and others, but not one named Arthur. However, 
in the 600 CE, the name Arthur started showing up in the birth records of noble families in the post-Roman Britain. So let's begin. Somewhere between 500 and 550 CE, the Britons appear to have held back the invading Anglo-Saxons advance. However, in the following years, they were pushed back into Cornwall and Wales. The territory held by the Saxons eventually became known as England, and the people in Wales were called Welsh from the Saxon word Wela, meaning foreigners or worse, slaves. The Welsh call themselves Cymru, indicating fellow countrymen and their country. He refers to Arthur as a warrior, not a king. He lists 12 battles fought by Arthur, including the Battle of Mountbatten and the City of the Legion. Most likely, his title was Dux Bellorum, rather than Rex or King. It was the Welsh cleric Geoffrey of Monmouth who wrote down in books 5 and 6 of the Historias, he established the basis of the Arthurian legends that we know today. His work, Historia Regnum Britannae, or English known as the History of the Kings of Britain, also known initially as the Gestus Britonium, or On the Deeds of the Britons, was written in the year 1133 CE. He claimed to have based the work on an ancient Celtic document in his possession. It became a bestseller of its time, and 200 manuscripts still survive. It was later foreign writers who have expanded his themes and added new strands to the story. By the way, Geoffrey's history is the first to mention King Lear's story that William Shakespeare would later retell and expand on this story. The Norman chronicler Wace was the first to mention the Round Table in his Roman de Brut of 1155. He simply says that Arthur devised the idea of a round table to prevent quarrels between his barons over the question of precedence. Now, Weiss's version is more of a loose and expanded translation of an almost 15,000 lines of Norman French verse based on Geoffrey of Monmouth's Latin history of the kings of Britain. Around 1177, Cretan de Troyes added Lancelot du Lac, meaning Lancelot of the Lake, also known as the Knight of the Cart. It's Cretan's story that is one of the first stories of the Arthurian legend to feature Lancelot as a prominent character. Robert de Boron from Burgundy was a French poet of late 12th and early 13th centuries who wrote several poems within the Arthurian cycle, Joseph of Arimathea and Merlin. The poem Joseph of Arimathea gives the Grail its holiness and sacredness. Remember, it is at this point in 1187 that the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem was surrendered to Saladin in the Holy Land. Robert wrote Joseph after 1191, which lines up when the monks at Glastonbury claimed to have discovered the coffins of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. The first English version was written by a priest known as Leomon in around 1200 CE. It pretty much follows Wass's 1155 release of the histories. However, in Leomon's version, Arthur did not die from his wounds. He remained on the island of Avalon to return in the future. Almost 300 years later, in 1485, and around 40 years after the Gutenberg invented the printing press, William Caxton published La Mort de Arthur, one of the first printed books written by Sir Thomas Mallory. This was a collection of eight stories that brilliantly drew together the whole saga and gave the account that we know today. The legendary King Arthur and the history of Britain are tightly intertwined. There is too much information to include here, so this is where I'm going to mention the Great Courses Plus, where you can take a course with a university professor who teaches the Arthurian legend. Professor Dorsey Armstrong explains in 24 lectures the history of Britain and the Celtic, Latin, French, and English legends from the Low to High Middle Ages. She will take you on tour through the historical sites attached to the title of King Arthur. I highly recommend the Great Courses Plus for this and many other subjects available. Oh, and I'm not sponsored by the Great Courses, but because I enjoy the classes so much, I'm sharing with you my affiliate link so you can take part in the learning opportunity. Rex quandum, Rex quae futurus, the once and future king. So, with the cross of Camden found in 1191 in the supposed remains of King Arthur and his second wife Guinevere, we took a look at the historical King Arthur, and not so much the literary Arthur, and all the characters that were added to the story of Arthur throughout the first millennium AD and the beginnings of the second. As noted, this cross has nothing on the back, yet will still make a nice uh, addition to my Grail collection, as opposed to my Indiana Jones collection, or 
my Han Solo collection, or perhaps I should even uh, start my own King Arthur collection. Um, so, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a like. If you wish to see more videos like this one, please say so in the comments below. Now, please, I also like you to please consider subscribing to this site. And as I mentioned before, I added a link to the great courses with a first month free code. And it's an affiliate link, and I enjoy these courses, and I just wanted to share them with you as well. Uh, so please stay healthy, uh, keep safe, and thank you for watching. Take care.